Thanks, guys. So, um, I think, as Kingsley said, I am uh, quite different, I guess, to what you might imagine from somebody from Dragon's Den. I think if I was to imagine myself, I'm a hybrid of a nurse and a dragon, whatever that might look like in real life. Um, as time has gone on, I spend far more time working in social justice than I do in business. I, I had, up until a few years ago, 15 businesses. I still have two in the UK and three in Ireland. Um, one in the US, actually. Uh, so I'm less involved in business, but I do think that this afternoon, rather than giving you the 10 steps to startup success, which I have done all the work for, for you, I've tweeted it out, the link to the whole thing, so you don't even have to make any notes. I'd prefer to talk about you as human beings and just tell you three things. I think that's the capacity of the brain this afternoon. Just three things that I can tell you that will unite all of you, I hope, as human beings. Uh, the first thing I'd like to say is, is for all of you to have a think about something, because at the end of my session, I'd love at least five of you to come up on stage and answer this question. It doesn't have to be about your business, but if ever there was a perfect time to pitch your startup and your business, it is now. Secondly, I will be talking about confidence being a significant issue and the wonderful thing about plasticity. So if you've never spoken before, if you're brave enough and courageous enough today to stand up, you'll find it an awful lot easier to stand up again when you next do it. I was with a taxi driver the other day and he told me the whole journey how he was terrified at his daughter's wedding and he had to drink 15 whiskeys and four pints of Guinness before he could get up and he was incoherent and he got murdered by the daughter and I said, you know, it's tough when you're speaking for the first time and he's given me his change and he said, and the son got married last month and sure I was grand. <laughs> and I said, that's plasticity. And he said, what? Is it the card? Anyway, so that's plasticity. So if you get a chance this afternoon, I'd say, those of you who are sitting in the audience who maybe are probably a little bit frightened of standing up to speak for the first time, at the end of my session, I'm going to dedicate some time. I would like you to capture all of us um, within the first 30 words. So I'm not going to ask you to do a one-minute pitch. So when I started out in journalism, if you couldn't answer the question who, what, where, when, and how in the first 30 words, in other words, an attention-grabbing first paragraph of a story, then people often didn't read beyond that. So I'm asking you to think about the who, what, where, when, and how of either your startup or maybe you as the startup. I'm hoping I can ignite some of you to think a little bit more about you and your life and where you're going. So have a think about that while we're going along. Um, and, I'm, and I do tend to come out amongst you if I don't see any hands risen, and particularly the bad people who sit at the back who think they're slinking in here and nobody's going to have a look at them. The second thing I'd say is make some noise outside this room. We're competing with the UCD Festival today, who are doing magnificently on Twitter. So it's hashtag the Start Summit, so please keep tweeting all the way through this afternoon. Include me in your tweets, and I will retweet everything once I get off the stage. So let's start with... Um, when I was on News Talk, um, there was a wonderful author. The women in the room will know her. Her name is Ruth Fields. She wrote a book called Run, Fat Bitch, Run. You all know? So she followed it up with a book called Get Your Shit Together. And my editor, who's Garrett Hart, said to me, the kids are in the car now, and they've been driven to school. If you say shit live on air, I will murder you. So Chris Donahue ran for the hills, go to the toilet, Nora, that one's with you. She's on the phone in North London talking to me. So, of course, she opens with, I said, great first book, I'm a big fan, run, fat bitch, run, and then get your act together. Brilliant. No, Nora, it's get your shit together. And I said, yeah, kids in the car now, Ruth, and it's just that time, 10 past eight, maybe we'll just use a different word. So she managed to say shit about 15 times within the next minute. <laughs> so I'm only saying that to give myself permission to say, everybody in this room gets their shit, and if you haven't had it now, you're gonna get it. So when I start talking about the shit that's happened in my life, I'm not making myself different. So I'm recognizing that there isn't a single person in this room that hasn't lost people to grief, that hasn't struggled with issues around physical or mental illness, that doesn't have loved ones who do also. But for me, that sometimes is how you find the measure of yourself as a human being. You know, lots of people will stand up and tell you how to be happy and how to flourish and how to live your life poetically. But actually, at the end of the day, most of us can do that until somebody gives us a side swipe. And then we still have to get up and dust ourselves down and get on. It could be the loss of a job, the loss of a career. It could be just the breakup of a partnership or a divorce. So for me, the big moment in my life, I was by no means running in the slow lane. I was in the fast lane of life, I think, I thought at the time, running all the businesses in Dragon's Den, dividing my time between London and Dublin. When my husband got very ill, 
and he, um, he developed a really aggressive form of cancer, and he died within three months. So how I can describe that to you is that sometimes in your life, you, you get on to a certain stage, and over New Year's Eve and having a bottle of wine, you, you start to decide what your future's going to be. Everyone does that. So we'd worked incredibly hard. He worked at the BBC. We had a young son. We imagined a future that was going to be totally different to the one that happened to me. And he died so fast, it was like a roller coaster. My sister passed away six weeks before he got sick, so if ever there was an annus horribilis in my family life, it was that one. So suddenly there I am without Richard, and I didn't want to run the business. If you, if you imagine, by the way, if you have a million, don't put it into magazine publishing. Um, but, but you know, when you publish and you work in the media, everyone wants energy from you. You don't walk in and slink to the back of the room and hope nobody notices. You have to walk onto the floor and talk to everybody and be the center of every boardroom, and the one that comes up all the ideas and makes all the decisions. And to be perfectly honest, I had no strength for anybody. I just about had enough strength to take my son to school every day. And, and I knew that at this point in my life, this was not the right thing for me. It wasn't the right thing for my business. It wasn't the right thing for me. I went on to work, replace Vincent Brown, to replace Ivan Yates. Um, I think for two years, I got up at 4 a.m. If I said to all of you next week, get up at 4 a.m. for five days, you'd probably fall over. I did that consistently for 18 months. I did leave Dragon's Den. Dragon's Den as much relies on your energy as it does your money. People want your expertise and your advice, and I didn't really have that to give at the time, so I felt it was immoral to continue it. But I did start a TV program called The Takeover, and I did 13 episodes. It's where I went into a business and kicked out the boss and took over with the kids. It's on Channel 4 now. Um, still great learning, I think, for young people, from hairdressers to golf courses to horse racing, to spas, to gyms, men's retailers, I went into all of them. I also worked in RT Cork on a Friday with Blonagny Coffee that, that you see Dahi and um, what are you doing now. So I did the Friday kind of loose women version down in Cork and uh, I also wrote my book. So the comedians were saying there's loads of jobs in Ireland, just Nora Casey has them all. <laughs> There is a reason, though, when we go through terrible times in our life, there's a reason why we might work at that pace. For me, in my personal life, when I wasn't getting the fulfillment that I wanted, um, I certainly discovered through almost an accident that if I started to work on my own two feet and I wasn't the queen of the boardroom and I was literally just myself going in in front of the camera, that I could get a lot of energy from doing just that. So it struck me at the time that um, during this crazy period. This phrase kept going over in my head saying, are you done yet? Are you done yet? Is that it? Like, you know, as Kingsley said, I grew up in the Phoenix Park. My father and my grandfather were rangers and went off to be a nurse, went to be a journalist, studied strategic management, went and did my PhD. And, you know, if you look at me in my life, even my TED Talks, everything's grounded on research. Not even grief was let off. It was nothing to do with your heart. It was to do with your head. So for me, are you done yet, was this phrase that kept going on. So I want all of you to think about that today. If you do nothing else today, just in your own mind, are you done yet, are you finished? You know, everything that your parents nurture, nature, your education, growing up, everything you imagined you would be when people said, what are you going to be when you grow up? Do you feel you've got there? Are you at that point now? Would you be happy just to, you know, pass away tomorrow and you'd say, well, it's all done. I did everything that I ever wanted to do. Because for me, I knew I wasn't done yet. I knew there was so much more that I needed to give, so much more I wanted to do. And I had a moral imperative. Do you know what it is? My husband died too young. There are lots of people in hospices all over Ireland that are going to die too young. Lots of mothers who, unlike me, I worry about my son getting to UCD safely on a bicycle. They worry about clean water, for food for their children in Sierra Leone. Everybody in this room has a life expectancy of 84. You get four more years if you get to 60, like bonus points. We have one of the highest life expectancies in the world, 20, 29 in Sierra Leone. So you have a lot of life to lead. A lot, a lot of life to lead. So if you have a moral imperative to get up and stand up, if you're healthy, you know, just think that you're doing it for all those people who never get a chance to do that. Through all sorts of difficulties, don't get a chance to live their lives to the full. So I engaged in what I'd call a self-audit, and I would encourage all of you to do the same, in going back in your mind and, and imagining your early life and thinking about whether or not things happened the way they should have happened. Conscious decision-making happens around 23. So my boy is 20, there's no point in asking him what he wants to be, what career he wants. Most of the time, our brains are not capable of developing that conscious thought about what we want to do in our future, whether it's in the medium or long-term future, until we reach around 23 years of age. But so often, we think things happen 
through serendipity, which they do, through luck, through you know, being in the right place at the right time, but quite often it's happening subconsciously. And I'm okay if your life happens subconsciously, but it would be a travesty if just by rote, by getting up and going through the day, you never really thought about what you wanted to do with your life. Why is that important? Because when you start off as a teenager, there's some of you in the room who are younger, um, my boy and his friends, they are at the most, I think, optimum that human beings can be at. They're debating, they're rowing, they're facing separation from family, new relationships, big decisions, studying for exams. God love those people doing the leaving set this week. It's a travesty. We're still making people regurgitate information at speed. So, so here are these human beings at 20 living their life to the full in terms of their brain power. Something happens in our um, mid-decade, 23 to 33 it is in Ireland, we're slightly older, it's called the decade of indulgence. Some of you are in this decade of indulgence. It's me, 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 me. So it doesn't happen to all of us. I meet a lot of people later in life who missed the decade of indulgence and they're still chasing it. So the decade of indulgence is supposed to be the end of full-time study and the moment when you settle down with husband, wife, partner, job, career, could be pension, could be mortgage. So those 10 years are critical in terms of going out and exploring the world and stretching your brain and your mind. But the real damaging thing happens after that. So not looking at any of you who might be over the 33 years of age. What happens after that is life starts to take over. You might have children. You certainly have responsibilities. Work sometimes has ratcheted up, so you're working much harder. You get up in the morning, you do what you're doing, go to the gym, go for a walk, end up at work, go and work all day, come home, have your dinner, maybe put the children to sleep, watch something on TV, go to bed, get up the next day. So you're living your life by rote. It happens to everybody, by the way. And then your brain, who hates that kind of shit, really wants you to be thinking of doing something fast moving and terrifying, it starts to agree with you. You're right, life is grand. We'll go to that Indian restaurant on a Saturday night, why would we go anywhere else? And Grand Canary was good enough for six years, should we go back again? We wouldn't like to go anywhere new and strange, should we know exactly where we're going when we go there? And then we have a smaller circle of friends, so we don't really as experimental with meeting new people. We don't really like to debate. The best thing you can do with somebody who has dementia is to have a big row with them. But we don't like to debate. In fact, I will go into a room that say, don't sit next to your man and have a row with himself. Come down here and sit with me. And we can talk about the weather and other sort of banal things that keep our brains nice and soft and don't be stretching them too much. So this life by rote is, is something that happens to all of us. And then, bang, oh my God, how did I get to 40? You know, I went to bed last night and I woke up and I'm 40. How did I get there? I, like, there's four decades gone and I haven't done half of what I want to achieve. I meet people at those big milestones, 30, 40, 50, 60, and they're still unconsciously drifting through their life. So I'd say to all of you today, this is one thing you could do. I did it because I had to, because a big bloody boulder happened in front of me. As much as I missed Richard, I missed my whole future. I no longer had the life I thought I was going to have. So I had to invent a new one. So, Cast your mind back over your life and just have a think about whether or not you're listening to music you used to listen to when you were a teenager to get up and dance, whether your hair is stuck in a bit of a rut, whether you're still wearing the same clothes, whether you find yourself go back again and again to do the same things week by week and give yourself a big kick. Get up there in a plane and throw yourself out without a parachute, except there is a parachute, but it'll give you a nice big dopamine fix. Now, so the reason why the brain doesn't like that is when my boy is at his age, he's looking to the future. And he's saying, I want to be. He's pinging his brain into the future. So why is that important? Because um, I'm a great fan of this man. His name is Thomas Studdendorf. He writes for New Scientist, National Geographic, The Economist, all sorts of things. He's one of the world's greatest anthropologists. So he studies what makes us uniquely human. And he wrote a book about three years ago called um, find the gap, what separates us from the animals. So Thomas Studdendorf set out to say, yes, we can believe in the Darwin theory, but we don't necessarily have to believe, this gets better. I'm going to give you a little bit of a zoetic moment here. So obviously Darwin thought that we came from the chimp and developed higher senses, and there we are as human beings ruling the world and actually actively killing off our competitors that are non-human. 
So Studdendorf, along with another six foremost anthropologists in the world, have looked at whether that is the case. So they believe that, yes, our near neighbors is obviously chimpanzees, orangutans, gorillas, anything in that particular kingdom. But they believe a slightly separate branch developed, which created human beings. And that although we share traits with other animals, there are two things that we alone have that no other species has. So the traits we share, I'm a total, as I grew up in Dublin Zoo, I live in Africa for a month every year. Um, I spend all my time in animal sanctuaries to make up for the fact that I grew up in Dublin Zoo. Um, it's a very conservative, like conservation-wise, under Leo Astigal, it's a brilliant zoo. It wasn't when I was growing up, I just didn't see it. So now I'm in Africa and I spend a lot of time with elephants and sanctuaries. And, you know, there's no doubt that the matriarch of the elephant tribe is communicating when she says, we're going in this direction, they all follow her. If you've ever seen dolphins or sardines, you know there's a communication mechanism going on there. You can certainly see love, monogamy going on in uh, the animal kingdom. So what are the two that are uniquely ours? Well, the first one is not going to surprise you at all. As human beings, we are hardwired to swap stories and share experiences just for the sake of it. Not to say, come over here, there's something nice to eat, we're going in this direction, wow, there's some danger, let me tell you all to scatter. Just because we like to sit in a bar still and have a chat with somebody next to us. We have a swarm mentality in terms of talking. All of you here today have been talking to each other, chatting to people on the phone. So what have the best brains of my generation been doing? Solving cancer? learning more unique and novel ways to swap stories and share experiences through all sorts of social media platforms. We have to do it. We are hardwired to do it. Hey, I'm up. How's the rest of the world, even though nobody's answering? We have a unique ability to communicate, even when there is no need for us to communicate at all. Uniquely human. We're the only ones who do it. But the second one is the real cool one, obviously. <laughs> Superpower that's inside all of you that you forget to use. The most unique and brilliant thing that humans possess is called mental time travel. So everybody in this room can ping their brains back to their earliest memory, not the one that your sister or your mother and father gives, but your absolute genuine earliest memory. Now, the reason why you sometimes remember moving house or the first day at school is if an emotion is attached to a memory, it's in a higher drawer in your brain. So you can retrieve that much more readily. So if you remember the birth of a sibling, or you moved house, or the divorce of your parents, or the death of a grandparent. That's because the emotion attached to it is stored higher. But you have that ability. It's like a little roll in your mind on a videotape. You go all the way back to the beginning, and consciously and subconsciously, everything that you've learned along the way, everything from education, from emotional development, from learning, from your parents, from your cultural values, all wrapped up, sitting in your brain right now, stored in all sorts of little corners of it. But that's not the unique bit at all. The unique bit is that you have the power. Well, actually, I'll tell you two unique bits. One is you have the ability to think of the Steve Hawkins theories. You can go back beyond your own physical memory. You can go back and have an appreciation of Big Ban, of all of the history, not just the wider geographical history, the history of Ireland as a culture embedded inside all of us, maybe the history of your own family, your genes, where you came from, what defines you. But the really unique thing, the real superpower is you can bring your head into the future. And through free will, set a course like a mental satnav and drive yourself towards it. No, no surprise that in, in sales circles, I walked in on a sales conference last month, and the guy up there was trying to sell, it was in LA, he was trying to sell a red sports car to all the sales leaders in the room if they hit certain targets. And he imagined, he got them all to imagine that they themselves were sitting in that red sports car, going down the Pacific Coast Highway, no doubt as it was 98% men with a hot chick on their side, with the sun beaming down and their wind in their hair. By the time he'd finished talking, everybody in that room believed that that red sports car belonged to them. And why is that? Because your brain is a bit stupid, and you can trick it into believing that that is exactly what it is that you're going to do. So if you're sitting today and you have no sat-nav, you're not going anywhere. Whereas if you meant, well, I'm going to get that PhD, I'm going to marry that man, I'm going to ask that girl out, I'm going to do that exam, I'm going to play in that rock band, I'm always talking about climbing Kilimanjaro, I'm going to do it, I'm doing it in August, if you want to come with me. Um, so, so setting a mental sat-nav for your brain is hardwired inside all of you, and you lose it. The whole point of the self-audit is to say to you, if you're not setting a sat-nav, you're actually dwindling towards old age. And even though I showed the good news about our 84 years of life expectancy, 
our vulnerable life expectancy is really bad. So around the mid-70s, we start to lose our faculties. And do you know why that is? Because we're not using our brain at all. We we, it's a self-fulfilling prophecy. You're sitting there, getting up, and I know how hard that is, by the way, because I am that soldier that, you know, a single mom at the moment, you get caught up in work and you get caught up in everything, and you forget that actually you have so much more of your life. The biggest uptake of PhDs is in the over 50s. I mean, even Robert De Niro did a movie on going back and being an intern late in life. You can do anything that you want to do. You should never imagine, you know, my, my, my friends live their lives through their children. I say, how are you getting on? Oh, John is doing the Leaving Cert. When that's finished, I'll be grand. How are you getting on? You know, so what happens to some of us who have children is that they become what we always wanted to be. They become the person that you rely on to fulfill all the things that you expected to fulfill in your life. So, number one, are you done yet? Number two, a little self-audit. You're only talking to yourself. So you can't lie. Just have a little mental chat with yourself as to where you're at and where you want to be. And then number three, set that sat-nav for your brain. Now I'm going to teach you something I never teach anybody, because it's a waste of time. No matter how many of you go out there and feel that you're fit and that you go to the gym, there is a muscle inside all of you that is very, very flabby. <laughs> very flabby and very hard for you to make it fit. The good news is if you're under 23, you stand all of the chances in the world of getting this muscle fit. So let me start by asking, does anybody know what blue ocean thinking is? So now we've spent a bit of time talking about you and your brain. I'm now trying to get your brain to think more innovatively, okay? You can think innovatively at any point in your life. It doesn't have to be about creating the big killer idea. It can also be about creativity in your own life. Blue ocean thinking, I lecture on it. I speak conferences everywhere on it. I have clients, which include the Four Seasons Group, and we work on this concept of blue ocean thinking. So blue ocean thinking um, is where you swim in the beautiful blue, clear waters of uncontested space, where we all want to be. In business terms, it's finding that unique, beautiful ocean where no one else is your competitor. Red ocean's bloodbath, everyone's merging themselves. They're killing themselves with price, they're being more competitive. I once had to speak on a stage about what one thing Ireland could do in order to be more competitive, and I said, engage in blue ocean thinking, because Ireland, we will never produce widgets faster, quicker, or cheaper than other areas of the world. We just can't. We have to rely on our brains. We have to rely on coming up with things that nobody else comes up with. Instead of that, I run a business clinic. What do I get? I have a great idea for a pizza online company. Right, you are. I go into villages, and they're like, we're decimated. You are, yeah, four cafes. Yeah, but I open at 8 o'clock. She only opens at half 8. Right, and two florists. Yeah, I get those special orchids, and I slash the price on a Friday when she gets the new ones in. So there you go, all merging each other in a, a bloodbath instead of thinking more creatively about what they might do. So young people, when I talk to 12-year-olds, 17-year-olds, they're fantastic. They grow up on Lord of the Rings and Harry Potter because you have to imagine something that doesn't exist. If I'm working with the hotel industry, we have a blank room, and I say, a stranger's coming to the door, what are you doing? You can't have anything in that room. A blue ocean thought does not involve you modifying anything that you, you come in here. That muscle is lazy, everything's invented. You don't have to think about it, and flick a switch, the light is on, oh my god, the projector doesn't work, get the man who does the projector. I'm walking on a lovely carpet, I'm sitting on a chair, I've got my phone to my ear. That muscle doesn't have to do anything. It's all there for you. No great revolution going on in terms of new thought processes. So when you're younger, if you exercise that muscle, my son, since the age of 11, has had to give me a blue ocean thought every Friday. It's very cool being my son. He's, he, he says regularly to me, including lots of expletives just beforehand. Um, but his friends then started coming in when he was you know, 12, 13, so now it's a kind of a big thing to do. The book, Blue Ocean Thinking, it just a new edition has just come out. I have about 15 versions of it. Because if you've ever tried to read Ulysses, it's a bit like that as an adult. And I am one of the biggest students of this thinking you will ever meet, and it still slithers out of my brain every now and again. When I describe a couple of ideas, blue ocean ideas, you'll say, sure, that's simple. But actually, the thought process behind it is quite complicated. The reason I have it, I have it the, next to me in the bed, I have it next to me in the car, it sits next to my desk. It's because every now and again, I'll forget something or I'll have to read it up again. So my advice is um, get a copy of the book. Don't imagine when you've read a chapter that you understand it, you don't. But there are about a 1,000 examples online. And I'll give you two that might resonate with you. Nintendo. At the time, gaming was entirely personified by my son. 
a geeky teenager alone in their bedroom playing games. Solitary activity. That's the entire gaming market. Nintendo got all of their staff trained on blue ocean thinking. So after a period of time, I think 18 months to two years, they came up with a game that revolutionized the gaming industry and opened a new market. They swam in blue waters for a period of time because for the first time ever, you saw an entire family, from grandchild up to grandparent, playing a game together in front of a television screen, Nintendo Wii. They also developed a game for women, never heard of before, Nintendo DS, all through blue ocean thinking. Blue Ocean Thinking created the mindset that said it doesn't have to be the way it always is. You can actually create something totally different. Now it's a bloodbath. They only lasted six to eight months before everyone else piled in on top of them. The second one is, is an easier concept. I grew up with circuses in Ireland. They were dirty, ill-kempt, low ticket price, worse, you had to carry it in a truck from town to town, aimed at children, cruelty, allegations of cruelty to animals. A group of people through Blue Ocean Thinking developed a circus that was adult only, fixed venue, high ticket price, no animals, Cirque du Soleil, created through Blue Ocean Thinking. So I would say to all of you today, instead of you thinking, there's a cool idea, I wonder could I steal that? Start thinking along the lines of what could you create that nobody has created? And I tell you, there are so many ideas that will come out of your head. They could be batshit crazy, but they're getting your muscle working. In a way, they're supposed to be crazy. If I start with 11-year-olds, I say, close your eyes, reimagine the room. Should they've got drawers flying out, and they've got, you know, witches flying overhead, and their dinner flying down on top of them. But should, that's the point of the muscle is you get them thinking that way. I always say to businesses all over the country, I go in, I say, don't be bringing in management consultants, bring in your 12-year-olds. They might be a bit crazy, but they'll come up with things you've never seen. They will have ideas you've never seen. So there's two things you can do. One, if you have children, Start them very early, get them to do blue ocean thinking thoughts every single Friday. So sometimes they'll come in and say, oh, new reflectors on my school bag. It's not a blue ocean thought because you've just used the school bag. You have to find something different to the school bag. The closest that Dara got recently, we were going to go away for some award ceremony, and I slammed on the steering wheel, give me a blue ocean thought, and he said, oh, thank you, Mum, for asking me that. I couldn't actually repeat what he said. <laughs> Anyway, after a while, he sort of put his phone down and said, I'll tell you what, see that steering wheel? That's a relic from the, dole, the dark ages. You, know, you, don't, you don't need that steering wheel. That's when you had to physically move the wheels. So I could give you a little computer console. You could sit in a big armchair there in the car, and you have a little computer, a little console there to move the car. Now, aesthetically, I would hate that. I wouldn't feel protected behind my big wheel, which is, as he says, useless, like no reason for us to have it whatsoever. So that was the closest he's got, I think, to a, to a blue ocean thought for some time. But, you know, it was, it was good back in the day. So I'm just going to pause for a second and find out how are you doing on your who, what, where, when, and why. Have we got people that are thinking along those lines? Right, let me tell you why it's so important. In Dragon's Den, everyone comes in with an idea. That's the whole format. And so you have armchair entrepreneurs at home going, oh, you missed a trick, you should have invested in them. You didn't see the four hours we saw, you just saw the two seconds. So everyone's an armchair entrepreneur, everyone loves the fact that somebody comes in with an idea, but I can tell you, the biggest lesson I learned is it's never the idea, it's the person. You probably learned that. I would have had more fun putting my money down the toilet and flushing the chain rather than working with some of the people I've worked with in Dragon's Den. <laughs> That's the truth. Great idea, terrible person. So there are seven traits of entrepreneurship. Doesn't matter where you look, Forbes, any university, there's all the same seven. Determination, resilience, risk-taking, charisma, you know them all, off by heart, right? So five of them are developed early in life, and you can only develop two in later life. That's the bad news. So when I go into, I went to a desh school. If you asked me growing up, would I be a businesswoman? I was, I'd never met a businesswoman in my life. I went to a desh school. And on the picture on the, the notice board when I come in, there's me and Joan Burton. She's no spring chicken, and I'm not either. So the unlikeliness of me being where I am is quite extraordinary. So when I go back there and I start talking to the kids, I'll say, which one of you have failed? Put your hands up. Which one has never chosen for the team out in the sports field? You know, the last one. So I was that, by the way. They got the best ones, and who's going to take Nora? Oh, somebody has to take her, yeah. <laughs> who's never chosen for the school play? Spectacularly, once I told my mother I was Misha Era. She thought it was a lead. It actually involved me wearing a sheet that had green, white, and orange when I put my arms out. <laughs> 
I am the most unlikely person to be confident. I was not the person who put my hands up ever at school. Those of you who know my story know that my first marriage was very violent, and I was just not confident at all. When I got to 30 and I took the biggest decision of my life to walk away from that marriage, I took the biggest risk. I'd say it was the, the biggest risk I've ever taken. I learned by then the art of resilience and determination, but confidence took an awful long time to come. So I know all of you out there who are thinking, I'm not getting up on that stage. I can tell you, I was not the person. I used to have a red rash all down here, a big lump in my throat, and it would all be dry. And so I can get up now and talk without notes. So you, you will be that person. Everyone can do it. You're not born a speaker. You're, you just do it by practice. So the si seven traits of entrepreneurship, when I say to the kids who's failed, I mean, the reality is the ones who have failed who aren't in the cool gang, are going to be the entrepreneurs of the future. They really are. The ones who are following everybody and wearing the same clothes and who want to be in the cool set, I always say, you'll be employees, and that's all right. The world needs employees. But see you guys who are just a little lonely and a little bit out on your own, feel a little bit bullied, don't feel part of the cool set, you'll be leading the world. That's the truth. Because we, we end up with young people in their 20s, and they've never failed because you know they had to be A students, and they had to be brilliant, and they had to be great. And then suddenly, life's just not like that. You know, you go out and you start your own business and somebody says no to your investment and you crumple in on yourself and think, ooh, that's it, it's gone. No, you get up, get up, back in there. Start back into the ring again. But we don't teach our young people those things. So these seven traits, the two you can learn in later life. One is confidence. I would love if it, even five of you walked away from here today taking the first step towards confidence. And the second one is adaptability. And adaptability you learn through failure. When I was growing up in business, nobody ever failed. We all did phenomenally well. Now we're shoving each other out of the way, telling you how much we failed. Oh, I failed much worse than him. I'd be here for four days if I told you about my failure. <laughs> but I'll only say two things. Failure is nature's harshest and best teacher. That's the truth, it really is. It can be tough. But failure is not just about how you fail in business. I've been honest with you today in saying, I don't believe what happened to me in my life was a failure. It's just something that happened to me in my life that has happened to all of you in your life. I'm getting up telling the truth about it because I think we don't do any service to society or to the next generation by pretending those things don't happen to us. I mean, I grew up in an Ireland where we didn't talk honestly about domestic violence. We didn't talk about sexual orientation. We didn't talk about alcoholism or mental health issues. I mean, where did that get us? You know, we never progressed as a society. And in the last few years, some brave people have stood up and talked about all manner of things so that other people can say, well, that's okay if it happened to her or him then it's okay for me to say it's happened to me. We just have to be honest and give testimony. You don't leave legacies behind in bricks and mortar. You leave them behind in terms of the good works you can do in sharing your story. When I talk to anybody who gets to the top of their career and they're sitting with me, I say, don't do a disservice to everyone in the room by imagining you just got there like that. I know all the routes that you took in order to get there, so let's be honest, because when I say to you about the sat-nav and how important it is to you, if you want to get somewhere in life, there are certain places that you want to get to in life, and your brain is going to be unreliable because it's never been there. It can tell you where you've been, but the best way you can get to where you want to be is asking somebody who's there already. So if I sit with somebody who's the head of a big technology company and they're honest with you, then you can learn from the fact that they did that journey. So adaptability through failure, whether it's your personal life or your business life, and confidence. So now. Who are my brave soldiers today that are going to come up here? Oh, great. Well, come all up. <laughs> so you have to, I, I think part of it is you have to use that microphone because it's a little bit more terrifying. Oh, thank you. It's this, this one here, here, here. And, and could you tell us who you are and the who, what, where, when of life? Oh, Hi, I'm Robin Twist. I'm a postgraduate student, just completed an accounting course, and I've applied for a master's. Just got rejected for the master's on Thursday, so I'm going to send in another application for a different master's in the same place. Hey, Back in again. Thank you. Is that your first time speaking, no? No. Okay, you can tell. Don't jump down there, you break a leg. I think you could just come up on stage, all of you, because it's going to be much quicker if you pass from one to the other. And also, it's a little bit more terrifying when you're up here, I can assure you, because I've been up here. Hi, um, Who you are? My name is Marion Kendi. I'm from Clomel, County Tipperary, and my company is called A New Mum. 
and we have developed products and technology to support mothers in their re <coughs> relief, reassurance and recovery after birth. Well done. Yeah. Best of luck with the new venture. <laughs> Thank you. Um, approximately 10 years ago, um, my, my class, well, former classmate and um, now business partner uh, succeeded in bringing 30,000 people in Africa out of poverty. Wow. He failed in being able to... So it's not about me. <laughs> he failed in being able to sustain that because what he did was very simple. He helped farmers cooperate together, work together, produce pro produce, and he found direct buyers around the world. He raised the price of their produce from 150 a box to 650 a box. Um, what I am trying to do with his help is recreate that technology, sorry, recreate that thinking with deep tech solutions, with a deep understanding of financial regulations, and fix or counteract the problems that caused it to fail, which was big players basically shutting it down. So we have a, well we're done. building the digital financial network to enable the small player level the playing field. Well done. Thank you. Well done. Hello, my name is Julia McAndrew and I'm from Galway and I'm the mother of two children and I was ill myself seven, eight years ago uh, with breast cancer and I healed myself through nutrition and since then I gave up all my treatment and I specialize in water as a water specialist and I realized it was the most important nutrient for her health. So that's for our health and for our homes and for businesses. Well done. Thank you. Uh, hi, my name's Cleona. Uh, I'm 37 years old. Uh, I've been a doctor for 13 years and a GP for six. And I noticed when listening to patients in the practice that not everyone wants to manage their cholesterol with medication. Uh, most people want to, to try diet and exercise, but sometimes that doesn't work. So I spent the last year developing a cholesterol supplement uh, called Cholesterol Low. The main ingredient is approved by the European Food Safety Authority. And I added in a few other ingredients that I discovered through research, help to lower your cholesterol. So I'm planning to launch that in the next couple of months. Great, thank, thank you. you. So, by the way, tweet. I think the one way you can help everybody up here is when they tell you their story, maybe you tweet and we'll retweet. It. Yours is a great initiative, thank you. Good afternoon, my name is Michelle and uh, my company is Monologue. And um, we help uh, businesses like yourselves with their brand, so we help them with their brand assets, anything from web design, logo design, and websites, and our ideal customer means that um, we want you to, uh, uh, we want to hand over the brand to you, so we work with you to develop your brand, and then you take it over, so we don't really want you to come back to us. A success story basically means that you manage your own brand afterwards, because you know it the best. Great. Thank you. So don't bring your brand back once you get it. <laughs> Thank you. Hi guys, my name is Stephen. Um, for about 15 years, I worked in the IT industry and I was in a rat race. And there's a lot of coincidence what you were talking about, Nora, um, because about five years ago, I got a phone call that changed all that. Unfortunately, my brother was killed in a road accident. And I realized that life is short. And I realized what was important, like just two months before that, where we all sat and took a family photo together and a moment that is special to me and I'll never forget that. So yeah. five years on from that, I now run a company called Our Mindful Moments, and I'm known as the Mindful Living Guy. <laughs> and every day I am present, and I am enjoying every moment. So my Thank mission you. is to bring corporate wellness programs uh, to the IT industry, where people will appreciate the moment and appreciate that we're not in a rat race, and we can pause, and we can enjoy our moments. Thank and actually, you. my wife works in St. Hope Street, Oh. And I have to say, she's very, very proud of that picture of you and Joan. And every time you come <laughs> <Thank> in. Thank <laughs> you. Hi, everyone. My name is Angela Burke, also known as the Integrative Coach on, on, online. Oh, I know who you are. <laughs> oh. <laughs> um, thank you for that. After spending most of my career as a recruitment and employer branding manager in the corporate environment, I decided to use the expertise that comes with that in you know, having the inside scoop on everything recruitment and how to get the job um, to start my own business just recently. And what I spend my days now doing is 
basically helping people to navigate a career or their own business that enables them to live the life that they want to live both personally and professionally. And I think that it's the personal piece that's really important and that's probably why a lot of us are here today trying to, you know, get going with our own business to facilitate the lifestyle that we want to live. Great. Thank you so much. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, my name is Vignesh Kunan, uh, and I have a similar story, uh, like a friend, like, you know, who came up above. Uh, uh, like, I was working in IT industry as well, and I was working as a consultant, and my dad passed away, and I had to kind of refocus and uh, see what, where I wanted to go, and now I work in a completely different industry. It's a manufacturing industry, uh, like, you know, setting up the team, like, you know, building the team, but I'm also working on myself and an idea, like, you know, that I'm pursuing. So, you know, I'm, I'm totally nervous standing here, like, you know, in front well of done. you, so, you know, <laughs> thank you very much, thanks. Well thank done. You. Well done. How is all? My name is Colin. I'm completely out of your comfort zone up here, but I realize it's for the best. You have to do it, you know what I mean? But, uh, my idea is to set up a mobile coffee unit. Uh, <clears throat> we have a good location picked there in Dublin 7. And uh, the reason why we're doing it is because it's crying out for a coffee shop. Um, I have an identical twin brother, similar to the happy pair, you know what I mean? But, uh, <laughs> I think we're, we're more like the, cr the crazy pair, you know what I mean? But, uh, uh, I'm, I'm a recovering drug addict myself, you know what I mean? And I'm just looking forward to getting, getting on with life and becoming more po positive. And, uh, just promote, promoting all the positive things that um, you need to do to recover from any sort of addiction or mental health issues. Thanks very much. Thank you so much. <laughs> well done. Hello, how are you? Yeah, how are you? Yeah, hi everyone. Um, I'm Tom Cullen. Uh, some colleagues and I are setting up a crowdfunding platform that's going to raise allow fundraisers through cryptocurrencies rather than fiat currencies. So just kind of slight twist on an old, an, an old idea. So that's it. Well done. Thank you. You okay? Uh, did a lot of you shower this week? <laughs> um, that first shampoo bottle you ever used is still out there somewhere. Recycled or not, it's still there. Yeah. Who decided shampoo has to be liquid in a plastic bottle? I'm saying it can be solid and I can provide it. A hundred thousand household turned into um, swap into Yanni Bars will save 2.4 million plastic bottles every year. Wow. I'm Yanni and this is Yanni Bars. <laughs> Smells gorgeous. And that's for you. Thank you. That's for me. Anything for you? Oh, <laughs> anyone who's making cakes, please come on. Um. <laughs> Hi everyone, my name is Patricia Fitzgerald. I've just recently launched um, Cork Card in Cork, that other city further down south. The capital! Uh, <laughs> oh, we've got some contingent here, good. Um, so if you could please follow me on Instagram, it's at City Card Island. So I'm launching in Cork. Say it again, the Instagram. At, at City Card Limited. City Card Limited. Okay, so I'm launching in Cork, getting it stable there, and then hopefully moving out to um, Dublin and around Ireland. And I suppose the easiest way to describe it, it's like a student card for professional people. Um, you get discounts on restaurants and stuff. It's oh, a yeah, membership card. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah. Well done. Thank you. Thank you. My name is Miren, and I'm um, working with languages, but I'm here to talk about a book called The 51 Inspired Migrant Women of Ireland, and a migrant, the same as many women who are sitting at the table. And uh, myself, I uh, had the opportunity to write a chapter of the book. That's myself here on a, on a bicycle. I like dancing as well. But I think there is an opportunity for people who are not born in this country, who maybe made Ireland or home. Maybe English is not our first language, and you can notice my Spanish accent. But we are here together, and there is a group of women here. We are actually a group of women entrepreneurs, migrant women, who meet together from time to time. That's meant if you want to talk to me afterwards. But I, I agree with Nora that we need to start from the beginning, look at our memories, and I'm really happy to be here. You are my inspiration in life. Thank you. Thank you. I met, we met before because I did the Migrant Women's event. Hi, uh, my name is Dara. I'm an 18-year-old from Galway in Ireland. So basically, me and two of my friends set up a digital marketing agency. We've kind of looked around at small and medium-sized businesses in Ireland, and 
we've seen that they're not providing value to their audience. So the key we've seen is providing value through content, through video, through pictures, to engage your audience and in turn, turn, turn them into loyal customers that you'll have for years to come. So if you're interested in working with us, graftandigital.com, my business partner down the back is there, or you can speak to us afterwards, but thank you very much. Thanks, Dara. Hi, my name is Seema. I'm a physical therapist and a yoga instructor, and I also have launched into being a distributor for Beamer, which is a bioenergy medicine device. Uh, being from the medical field, I've all constantly treated patients with so many ailments, and there are options available for healthier uh, outcomes other than allopathic medicine. So I appreciate the MD who stood up and talked about the cholesterol lowering and yeah. the corporate wellness person. Um, there are, uh, when I came here, I came with big ideas about a year and a half ago, just trying to support my husband, who is an executive here. And I was kind of uh, told that I couldn't work and I couldn't run a business. That was a year and a half ago of sitting and thinking and thinking. Uh, but uh, Ireland has been a great place to Woo! just learn. I think Ireland is a great um, place to learn. So just to learn. So even though I've been at home, I have never missed an opportunity to learn in the year and a half. And as of last week, they allowed me to work in Ireland. Yay! Yay! <laughs> well done. Still can't, still can't run a business, but I can work. So look out. <laughs> I think you'll be running that business, though, don't <laughs> Now, I think we're coming to the end because they're going to murder me on the timing, are you? Is it okay if we do these last three? Thank you. Hi, I'm Angelina Ball, um, co-founder and director of Phoenix Interior Design. Um, the reason I'm here today, it was a very successful business for five years, um, but myself and my business partner have amicably split. So I've experienced setting up a company while pregnant, going back to work, um, when my daughter was seven weeks old, and the company was absolutely fantastic and had a great experience. I literally closed the business on Friday, and I'm starting again on Tuesday, back in my kitchen with five of the team that I'm taking from Phoenix. Phoenix. And oh, so great. it's experience that, you know, you can set up, you can be successful. It may not always go to plan, but it's a, a new start now from well Tuesday. Done, yeah. okay. Best of luck with it. Hi, I'm Stephen Booth. I've uh, survived four startup failures, two of them my own. I'm still here, and I'm working on another one. Uh, you've heard from Tom, uh, one of my co-founders. It's a crowdfunding by crypto startup trying to help everybody else in this room raise money through alternate markets. Good luck, guys. Thank you. How do they get hold of you? How do they get hold of you? Ulysian.com. Ulysian.com. Yeah. Last but not least, and she brought some stuff. A salad. Okay. Save the best for last. Um, guys, my name is Jessica Nolan. I'm the co-founder of Flax and Beets. So basically, it's a functional food company. Um, what I've brought up here is one of our signature salads. So they're all functional salads designed by a medicinal chef. They each have a specific purpose. So this one here is called Inner Strength. It's designed for beauty and gut health. We have one designed for athletes, for vegans, for brain function, and we have a range of breakfast items and snack items as well with a dinner range coming soon. Um, we're gonna be in the next four weeks launching our website, which will deliver these foods direct to offices, homes, whatever. So if you guys follow us on Instagram, it's Flax and Beats. We'd really appreciate it. Thanks so much. Thank you, well done. Thank you so much. And, and a big thank you to all of you who came up here. That wasn't easy. I know some of you are shaking because you're standing next to me, but you know, it, it was incredible to do that because you will never be afraid to do it again once you've stood up and done it here. I'm going to leave you just with one thought, and I never normally quote people, but you know that Einstein quote, and maybe it's a bit cliched, if you judge a fish by how well it climbs a tree, it's going to spend its life thinking it's stupid. But that, that has always resonated with me. When I was in nursing, I realized after five years it wasn't right for me wasn't right for me for all sorts of reasons. I love nurses. I spend a lot of my time with nurses. I switched to journalism, which is really important to me. I discovered very quickly I got a greater kick out of running businesses than maybe working in them, and started to invest in other businesses. But also when my husband died, I had to take that decision again. I was the wrong fish in the wrong place climbing a tree, and I knew that I had to change. And sometimes, for all of us, once you've done your self-audit and set the sat-nav, it may mean you have to make a decision about your life. It could be a hard decision to leave work. Sometimes it's a hard decision. By the way, I gave this speech about two months ago and two of my staff left the next day, gave me a big flowery letter saying you're quite right. <laughs> <laughs> 
So, uh, but it sometimes does lead to hard decisions. Maybe moving out of the house, maybe splitting with a partner that's holding you back, maybe letting go of friends that are holding you back. But you know, you have to have that courage. I mean, for me in my life, I've had so many twists and turns. There's nothing normal about my career path. And I still, like, at the moment, I'm filming with Magdalene survivors. So who would have thought that I would spend the whole of the last year working with women who survived the laundries? But I said yes when somebody asked me what I have there their first ever networking meeting, which happened this time last year. And I have to tell you, it was the most emotional thing I've ever done in my life, probably the most important thing I've ever done in my life. And I've stayed close to them, and now I'm working with four of the women, telling their stories. It's gone out in RTE, by the way, on the 25th um, of this month. So I think if you're open to the idea that you can achieve the things that you want to do, and you, you think about whether you feel comfortable doing what you do at the moment, whether you're up out of the bed in the morning saying, thank God I'm going in here now to work for the day, you'll know, you'll know instinctively. Thank you for listening to me, and thank you especially to all of you who came up and spoke. Thank you.